and Photography book series published by the University of Texas Press. With us tonight from Texas State University are President Denise Trout. Yes. Dr. Van Wyatt, Vice President of Information Technology. Joan Heath, Associate Vice President of the University Library. I'd like to recognize and acknowledge our founding donors, Bill and Sally Whitliff. With us tonight from UT Press is Theresa May, Editor-in-Chief. Our event tonight would not be possible without our partner sponsor, Susan Cruz Bailey. Thank you, Susan. I would like to thank Bill Whitliff and Kate Brakey for their collaboration on this exhibition. <laughs> and I'd like to thank John Scott, our framer, and the entire Whitliff Collection staff and our student workers. In 2001, we published Kate's first book of photographs with UT Press called Small Deaths, and it featured an essay by noted critic A.D. Coleman. He is here with us tonight to introduce Kate. Uh, Mr. Coleman has published several books of his essays, including Light Readings and the Digital Evolution. His website and blog is photocritic.com. Please join me in welcoming A.D. Coleman. Good evening, and thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the applause. And uh, I want to thank Bill and Kate and, and Carla and, and the people here at the, uh, at the Whitliff Collection for bringing me out for this event. This is my first time here at the collection, not my first time in Texas by any means. But um, uh, I, it, the space is beautiful, the installation is beautiful, and, and I have to think that, I, that the, the level of support that this represents for an artist at mid-career like Kate is, is, uh, must be astonishing to experience from within as the recipient of it, and is a remarkable model for, that I hope will be replicated elsewhere for other artists who have, who have accomplished a great deal uh, but aren't yet senior figures. It's just fantastic. So congratulations to you, Kate, and congratulations to you, Bill, and Sally for making this available to living, working artists uh, who are at the height of their powers. Which also includes Bill, who, who was saying, saying to me and uh, Terry Edderton tonight, I'm still young. So, and I, I know that feeling. I'm still young, too. Um, if you want to know what I, what, I, what I think as a critic about Kate's work, I, you, you can read my essay in Small Deaths, which still pretty much holds, holds true, you know, although there's been a lot of work that she's made since then. I thought I would tell you just more conversationally and anecdotally about my first encounter with Kate's work and with Kate and, and Paul Krieg, her husband. Uh, and, uh, and then a, a more recent uh, experience with them. And the first encounter was in 1998 at Houston Photo Fest, and I'm sure many, if not all, of the people here have, have been to Photo Fest. And uh, what you may not know if you've gone there just as photographers or if you've just gone there as, as uh, image lookers, is that Photo Fest invites in a whole bunch of uh, photo world and art world VIPs every time to review portfolios as well as, as international art and photo press. And in the afternoons, after the portfolio reviews are finished, they, they tour them around at, to the various exhibitions that PhotoFest has sponsored all over Houston. And PhotoFest, all along, ever since it started in 1986, I think it was, has um, uh, used a lot of the venues in downtown Houston, a lot of uh, em empty and unused storefronts and other spaces. Down in, in downtown, as well as, well as uh, 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 corporate, corporate building lobbies and, other, and, and occupied spaces uh, to showcase work for the, for the run of the festival. So 
I, I remember being on, on the, one of these tour buses with, with a cluster of, of my colleagues, and it was probably about 5, 5.30, I guess, late February, early March in, in Houston. So you had this, this sort of glowing afternoon raking light, and this bus pulled up to a corner. I can't remember exactly where in downtown, but we pulled up to this corner. I had not, I, I wasn't familiar with casework at this point, and there were, there were these prints in the, in the front windows of, of, a, of, a, of an abandoned storefront. My impression, my, my memory tells me they were six feet tall, Kate, okay, that can't have been right, right? But they, but they what? They're back there? Okay, well, they, they looked about, see, they were just glowing, right? The sun was just right, right? They were just, just hitting these prints, the colors were just, gorgeous and saturated and that was the that was the impression in some ways that has stuck in my mind about Kate's work ever since not just not just the color but the, but the power of those images I, I must have been a hundred hundred and fifty feet away from them and they still read very clearly uh, and so, so that was that was a very very powerful first impression and I, I'm, I'm surprised to learn that they're as small in a sense as they were because in my memory they're still probably about six feet tall anyhow so as a result of being there, I was there as a journalist, uh, not as a portfolio reviewer. I, I got to meet uh, Kate a, a bit, although she, she was uh, very much uh, being surrounded by new admirers. I think you were just sort of really coming out at that point. I think that was sort of your big breakthrough. And, uh, and, and meeting Paul, and we got to ch chat a bit. And uh, you have to understand, you know, Paul, you may or may not know, is in a whole other world. Paul's a microbiologist. And so if they go together to microbiology conferences, Kate is, of course, the, you know, Paul's eye candy, right? <laughs> and, 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 and conversely, if they go to a photo event, you know, Paul is the dumb blonde on her arm. <laughs> you know, the, the, the trophy husband. So, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, I, I chatted a little bit with Paul and got to see him, and, and he knows a bit about photography because he's been around Kate all these years, of course, but it isn't his discipline. Well, PhotoFest attracts aspiring photographers from all over the world, and they register for these portfolio reviews, and some of them can't get in because the registration gets closed, but they come anyway in the hope that somehow someone will look at their work. PhotoFest at that point was holding a portfolio reviews in the Rice University Student Center. And right down, the, hall, right down the, the hallway from the big room where they had the table set up with the, with the official reviewers, there was this little alcove with banquettes and coffee tables that, uh, that I called the Salon des Exclusés because the people who couldn't get into the portfolio reviews would hang out there and put their portfolios out and try to drag people like me in to look at their work if we had a spare moment. So one afternoon, I was passing by, and there was this big crowd in the, in the Salon des Exclusés clustered around uh, some portfolio. So I went in just to see what was happening, and it was Paul <laughs> reviewing portfolios. And, um, I, and I guess people are thinking, well, he's connected to Kate Brakey, and she's hot, so, you know, he must know something. And they had, they had dragged him in, and so, so there, there he was reviewing portfolios. So I, I listened for a couple of minutes, and he had some astute things to say. So I, I leaned over and whispered in his ear, you're a quick study fella, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and left. And, and I, I guess it, it, there's a kind of sense to that. It's probably some kind of lingering maternal advice that kicked in there. You know, if, if the microbiology thing doesn't work out, he'll have portfolio reviewing to fall back on. <laughs> so, We've, we've crossed paths a little bit from, from time to time since then, but never really had a chance to spend real time together. But uh, I've been curating shows in Beijing, China for the last couple of years and curated some of Kate's work into a group show of four people in Beijing uh, about a year ago, uh, a show called Light Quartet. And you can see the little catalog for it in the, in the book collection, the book uh, vitrine out here. And, uh, putting together four people who work with some very interesting different processes that I thought would be uh, useful for, for Chinese people to see as they get an introduction to Western photography. So this was Kate, Connie and Bowden, uh, Jerry Spagnoli, a daguerreotypist, and uh, Robert Stivers, who some of you may know from Santa Fe. 
And uh, we got to invite them, uh, all of them, over to, uh, to a festival in the south of China in a city called Dali, an old historic city, this past summer. And uh, Robert couldn't make it, Robert Stivers couldn't make it. The other three made it, and Arnold Minkinen, who some of you may know, the Finnish-American photographer, also came along. So there were, there were about eight, eight or nine of us all together, including my wife, Anna. And uh, they were in this, in this historic city. None of these other folks, had, well, Arno had been to China once, and his wife Sandy, but none of the other folks had been to China before. So I have to tell you, they were very good travelers, uh, all, all of them, uh, Kate and Paul certainly included. And I want to say particularly about Kate, because she's going to talk or does talk. She gave a very eloquent presentation, by the way, about her own work uh, to the Chinese audience. Um, but uh, you know, we, we, we talk about reverence for life and, 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 and all of that. And um, yet, one afternoon, I think it was maybe been after she gave her talk or after one of us gave a talk, we went out to have some, some beer and snacks by the river. There's a little river in the town that flows down to the lake, and you can actually sit by the, by the stream, sort of, on, in a cafe and, and nosh on things. So we ordered off the, the menu of snacks, and this included uh, spicy chicken feet <laughs> and uh, fried crickets. <laughs> and you know, Kate and I, we really got into the chicken feet and the fried <laughs> crickets. I'd say more than any of them. <laughs> and uh, two nights later, we were, at, we were at a banquet where there were more crickets, and we had actually by then become cricket connoisseurs and we're saying things like, no, 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 these don't have enough snap. I like my crickets much more crunchy than this. So uh, anyhow, I, I, I think that, uh, that that's, that's really what I want to say. That the work, work has been very well received in China uh, at the festival in Beijing. Um, it's well received everywhere and I, I think it's because the work is solid and durable and it touches something very deep in people across cultures as well as within our own culture. So I think without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Kate. Is you next here? Yes. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Alan. And just let me get set up here. Hope I can get it all to work. Oh. oh, just advance. Oh, OK. So, first of all, the only reason Alan Coleman is actually here tonight is because he knows I have all these compromising photographs. <laughs> so here he is with the Chinese equivalent of Playboy bunnies <laughs> in Derby, having a fine old time. They're about two feet bigger than he is, of course, <laughs> and very lovely and shy. And here he is carousing drunkenly <laughs> with all these wonderful ethnic Chinese who had some kind of drinking game we didn't understand what we're perfectly happy to participate with. You know. And just to prove to you, here we are eating our chicken feet. I think they were fried, actually, fried chicken feet. I actually tasted the boiled ones and oh. Anyway, we're showing off. I was showing off. Um, many of you know, of course, that I'm from Australia from there, and I actually did this for my Chinese audience so that, you know, they could see. <laughs> and um, also many of you know that I'm a bit of a show-off, and I've always been a bit of a show-off, and I'm still doing this kind of thing, of course. I think I was like six, and that's a very deadly brown snake, but it is dead. Um, so, whoops, wait a minute. Uh, uh. Tonight is surely the biggest show-off occasion of my life. <laughs> um, because of this, I mean, who, who in the world gets to have 150 pieces up in the same building? Um, so it's incredible and a bit overwhelming. And I'm, of course, very fortunate. I've had a very fortunate life in general. I came to Texas 20 years ago. Um, and this is the next slide, as you can see. I went into serious training to be a Texan um, back in 1960. <laughs> um, because apparently I always knew I was coming. Um, I always wanted that bumper sticker that said I wasn't born here, but I got here as fast as I could. I didn't get here until um, 1988 because I came to Texas with 
my husband, Paul Krieg, who got a job at UT, and we instantly fell in love with Texas, in particular Austin, which I still call home. Um, I did a graduate degree at the University of Texas um, in the Department of Art and Art History, and then soon after that I met Bill Whitliffe, who decided that I was sort of a Texan by then, and that I was all right, and he liked the work I did. And so for many, many years I listened to his bad jokes, and slowly I accumulated a lot of compromising photographs of him too. And as you can see, it's all paid off nicely. <laughs> But it's not in my interest to show those pictures because his wife Sally's an attorney. <laughs> and I'm hoping for another show like this. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I will show you a few. This is how I know Bill best. We, we go out with Bill and uh, this is down in Mexico and um, this is Bill exposing film to a donkey. <laughs> and uh, here he is doing the same thing with Cactus with one of his strange pinhole cameras. And here he is trying to get in on my photo. <laughs> which he always does. Anyway, seriously, again, I can't tell you how grateful it is um, that I am to have had my career as an artist changed by, significantly changed by um, the generosity of Bill and Sally Whitliffe, um, who have become my dear friends and are responsible for this entire thing. Um, and at this point, I'm going to seriously thank a whole lot of people, and then I'm going to get on to showing you a whole lot more stupid, compromising pictures. Um, <laughs> I'm very lucky to have worked now twice with uh, UT Press and the Whitliffe Collections. Uh, I'd like to thank Joanna Hitchcock, uh, Theresa May, Dave Hamrick, who I don't think is here tonight because he's ill. Um, but in the particular, this time I worked with Alan um, Mackey, who designed the book with me and Bill, Bill and me. Um, and Lynn Chapman, who had to deal with translating my obscure colloquial Australian uh, ramblings into some form of American English. I want to thank all the people at the collection, in particular Carla, who I don't think she knew what she was up for, um, because Connie Todd retired and uh, is probably very glad she did when she sees what, what, what had to go on afterwards. But Carla put this beautiful show together, and uh, Michelle Miller uh, designed all of the publicity um, that you got in the mail and see around the place. Um, all these people are... Um, wonderful, smart, interesting people, many of them artists themselves, and doing a book and a whole show with them has been a great pleasure. I've made a whole lot of new friends. I want to sincerely thank uh, Susan Bailey for her sponsorship. Um, I have lots of friends here tonight celebrating this occasion with me, very old ones and very new ones. Uh, one of my oldest friends of 30 years came from Australia, she's here in the front row, um, to be here tonight, although actually I think she was really here just for the Mexican food. But um, <laughs> she was the director of the first photography gallery in Adelaide, South Australia, back in 1979, um, where I had my very first photography exhibition while I was still a student at the art school uh, in South Australia. And I was just still learning to be what it meant to be a practicing artist. I was learning to cut mats and build my own frames and that I was learning that people actually were prepared to pay money for <laughs> the art that I make, which was inconceivable to me back then. There are two people here uh, who have made it conceivable, um, Terry Etherton, who shows my work in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and Steve Clark, who works his butt off selling my work in Austin, Texas. Um, I hope you know I've got an exhibition at his gallery tomorrow at four o'clock in Austin. Um, so uh, I also want to thank um, my very long-time friend and neighbour. Um, actually, we'll go on to the next slide now, I think. Oh, I was supposed to be, I, you were supposed to be looking at that slide while I was thanking everyone, just as a, the relief from Bill. <laughs> OK, this is the next slide. So um, I moved to, uh, to Tucson uh, again 11 years ago and had the good fortune to move in as the neighbour of Martha Smith, who's also here in the front row, who I became very good friends with. I bought a horse from her and, and I bought my horse with her. I live just across from there. We live out in the desert, in uh, the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. Um, she recognised right away when she met me that uh, as an Australian I would never turn down a dare and, or, a, or a drink. <laughs> and I realised right away that she was wicked and fun and employed her to work with me in the dark room and we've kept each other amused and entertained for 10 years in the dark room while getting quite a lot done. Um, finally, I'd like to thank Paul Krieg, my husband. Um, I've known him for 30 years. There he is, a long time ago. <laughs> 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 
Um, I want to thank him for his love and his friendship and his support. I met him when we were both students uh, in like 1977. He had saved up to buy himself a Hasselblad camera, as you can see. And I took that camera from him very soon afterwards. And I, <laughs> as his girlfriend, I had the right. And I, and I use it actually to this day. This is the same camera I use to this day. Um, I think we've bought a couple of new backs for it and had it repaired two or three times. But as you know, Hasselblad cameras are uh, fully manual. I, I think I also took the jean jacket. <laughs> anyway, he has very graciously accepted over the years that being with an artist is not an easy time. In fact, very last weekend, a neighbour, as they often do, called me to say there was a big dead javelina on the road uh, some, some ways away. And I actually woke him up because I realised the javelina was going to be heavy enough that I couldn't get into the back of the car myself. And woke him up and said, come and get the dead javelina off the road. <laughs> so in the middle of lots and lots of traffic, and I, did, I, I, was, I have the photograph of this, but it's, it's too awful. It's this great big dead thing that's bleeding, and I decided I shouldn't, I shouldn't show you after you've eaten such beautiful food. <laughs> anyway, he, um, he digs a lot of holes. <laughs> and, he <laughs> and then because sometimes he has to bankroll me, um, he goes and sells his science secrets to the Saudis. <laughs> Okay, so the greatest, no, this is not funny, this is true. Um, and I wrote this again because I was speaking to the Chinese and the whole talk was being translated and I thought if there was some English that they could read. So some of these have captions that I didn't take off you guys. Um, the biggest influence on my work is, uh, is recent, most recently in the last 10 years has been um, living in the Sonoran Desert outside of the city on sort of four acres against a big national park where we have this huge range of wildlife that we encounter and beautiful, beautiful uh, landscape in general. Most of it very alive, of course. Um, <laughs> bobcat, our beautiful bobcat, who comes and visits our poultry water on the front porch. Havelina, very much alive. It's herds of them, actually, that trot through our front yard. Lots and lots and lots of rattlesnakes. And in fact, my best story to date is that we had two rattlesnakes under our couch in the wow. living room because we left the back door open. <laughs> this is after we had swung the couch back to, to get to them. And of course, we don't kill them. We have snake tongs and we pick them up and we take them back outside. And uh, here they are on our IKEA um, mat. <laughs> Anyway, lots and lots. And I mean, obviously, when you look around, you know, these animals, when they're dead, when I find them dead or someone else finds them dead, and I want to make a memorial to them, you know, th these are the creatures that uh, are out there in the desert. Everything dies. Um, woodpecker. And, you know, so, so I find a dead bird and I, I try and make some, some piece of art that does that beautiful thing, some justice somehow. Even, <laughs> even the scorpions. Yeah. They're pretty, no, they're beautiful things. And as you saw, in, this whole series was called Memories and Dreams and it was what I imagined the creatures wanted to do in their afterlife. Um, and I decided that all the lizards would like to be able to fly. So that's a horny toad with some metal gold wings from a lamp. <laughs> and a rattlesnake on a piece of lace, etc and a gopher snake on a piece of lace. Those two last pieces are very new and they're in Steve's show tomorrow at four o'clock. <laughs> anyway, so um, now I'm just gonna completely ruin all my credibility and show you some of the sort of the behind the scenes making of this art. Um, this is the same Hasselblad, Paul's Hasselblad. Um, and again, as you know, they're you know, ancient but very nice German built uh, cameras that are totally uh, manual. Swedish. Swedish. It's the Zeiss lenses that are German, right? See, he knows. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, this is, I've got myself a dead Cody here, which I'm taking home. And um, laying out, this piece is over there in the other room. This is part of the memories and dreams. This is a, a, you know, a Cody in his afterlife. 
I find myself standing on a lot of ladders <laughs> for the big creatures. Um, and as long as I've got a tripod that I can make very tall, I can usually do most things. Um, this is actually before I had a freezer. I went out and bought a freezer from Costco the other day um, because these things spend a lot of time in the fridge. And after my husband complains and people stop accepting dinner <laughs> invitations to, to dinner, I, uh, I bought some freezers and now I've, I, that javelina that we picked up last weekend was so big that I had to buy a freezer and put it in. So that's the piece. Now, sometimes when I'm not in my studio, we actually go off to Australia every year to see our family and I occasionally find these dead things and I have to improvise. So the picture, here it is, the Australian raven, I think, yes, yeah, back there on the back wall. That, this is me making that picture. And as you can see, I have found in this particular little shack that we stay in, some kind of wine cooler vessel. And this is the bed lamp that I'm using to light. And I think I've got um, a tripod there. But here's another one where I did a little set of Australian wildflowers. And you can see that that's like a pillowcase to make the background a bit darker. And again, I've got a a bed lamp that I'm holding. So, you know, anything's possible if you can control the lighting a little bit and you've got an empty wine bottle. <laughs> so, in fact, I made this particular piece um, at that, on that occasion because there are these wild freesias that grow in South Australia. And then this is the raven, which is over there on the beach um, that I found and dragged down onto the beach and then I got myself the plastic chair off the veranda of this shack and decided I'd do pictures of the raven, so that's, that's that. So I'm all for the low-tech thing. <laughs> Commercial photographers are horrified, of course. Okay, so um, in this book, uh, Painted Light, I've written a long introductory bi biography in which I've tried to outline um, the course of events that led to who I am and what I do and why and so forth, that growing up in rural Australia um, with, you know, very beautiful wilderness, which is sort of empty of people compared to the most, most of the Northern Hemisphere, is a pretty, pretty nice experience for a child. Um, and I had some very eccentric relatives <laughs> who were animal rescue people. This is my aunt. I've tried to figure out what that book she's reading is. But this is a possum, what we call a possum, which is not the same as your opossums, it's a ring-tailed possum. Um, and she used to rescue them. And this is, no, it's just sitting on a lap, drinking, probably it's drinking a gin and tonic, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, she had tons of rescue animals and she and her husband uh, used to race old uh, Norton English bikes, um, bore them out and do them up and race them cross country. And they were wonderful, interesting, exciting people. In my book, I, I've said that when they couldn't get the parts for these bikes, they used to melt down saucepans and cast them themselves. I mean, amazing stuff. Um, this is also practice for coming to Texas. You see, I've got some very um, lovely Indian dolls up there that didn't fit in my two-story dollhouse quite. But I remember loving those dolls. I had no idea actually what they were. Um, but of course, rather politically incorrect these days, but I think that was my five-year-old birthday present was those dolls. The curtains are great. I would love to have those curtains now. <laughs> this is my aunt painting. So basically, you know, all these people in my life taught me to have an interest in the natural world and taught me to be gentle. Ta she taught me to hand colour, actually. She, had, she used to hand colour photographs for a local photographer and she had a set of the little oils that they used to use back then. And um, there were books on how to hand colour, which is a step-by-step -step guide to how to hand colour. And um, I still have her little set. I kind of inherited it from her. In those days, they used to sell those kits as hobbyist kits, and that actually provide you with the photographs to hand colour. You didn't even have to make your own photographs. Anyway, as I, and my uncle used to shoot Super 8 movies, and he had this little room where he would edit them, and he'd make titles, and they were very into making their own little home movies. Um, so well, these people actually, you know, they taught me about art, they taught me about living a creative life, they taught me to be gentle, uh, they taught me to love animals. Um, and I guess they, you know,
gave me this desire uh, to be an artist and, and the courage, I guess, in some ways, to be, to be one. Um, here's some of their rescue animals. There was always all these animals that didn't understand what they were because they'd been brought up with other animals, so they all got along perfectly well. That's my Auntie June with a big snake. Another big snake. <laughs> There's a snake theme here, I think. <laughs> Anyway, just to finish off, um, I've actually dedicated this book to my mother, um, who's about to turn 80, and I'm very sorry she can't be here. She, I guess she'd love to be here, but she's getting too old to travel, and I'd hope that, you know, I sent her a book, the first book I got, I sent her, and she, um, she was delighted and touched and so forth, and, you know, read things that she really didn't know about what I thought about them all, and I'm hoping that she's here in spirit tonight. So that's it. That's my that's my final. Thank you. Do, uh, do I do I have to answer questions? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? What was the name of this writer again in Austin where I could get the little book? Oh, he's here, Jace Graff. Jace, would you identify yourself? The lady here wants to know whether you have any of the little uh, accordion books. Uh, sure. <laughs> there you go. I did it. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, what were the symbols on the shower curtain? What were the symbols? You said, oh, I wish I had that shower curtain. No, it was just a curtain. No, just the 1950s, lovely 1960s. But what were those little symbols? I don't know. They oh, just, I think they were just like... <laughs> No, no, I think they're just like you buy now at Ikea, you know, they're the revival of those decorative, uh, I don't know, mid-century forms. I thought they were going to be something wonderfully No, no, yeah. no. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. What do you do with the animals when they come out of the freezer? Paul buries them. <laughs> oh, thaw them out, yes, I have to thaw them out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Any yeah. And I pose them with, with a lamp and a wine bottle, you know. So. How did it first occur to you to take a photograph of a dead animal as a kind of memorial for that? Um, I think because I'd always uh, done a little bit of animal rescue unofficially where you try and, you know, bottle feed a thing or a bird or whatever and put it back in its nest and, and I'm always sad when it dies because often they do. And... Um, what you've got in your hand is a is a beautiful, beautiful little corpse, basically, is what I talk about. And I guess as an artist, as a photographer, my immediate reaction is to want to make a record of it. So I decided I would prop it up in front of the camera and make a picture of it. And in the book, I talk about how when I did this and made it life-size or human scale, it was remarkable for what, how it changed, how it became this sort of personality in a way because of the way we anthropomorphize when we look at something's face. It has a gesture or expression or whatever. And I was totally blown away that by making a big human scale portrait, you gave it this, um, you know, th this sense of itself and dignity maybe, I don't know. But for the record, you know, it's like an individual thing. It's not just a dead specimen anymore. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> almost all the work that we're seeing here, and almost all of your work, involves living things that have died. But there's a series in there, the, 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 uh, was the Principles of Mathematics. Yeah, Laws of Physics. Yeah. Laws yeah, of Physics, okay. right. And I'm, I'm wondering if that was a sort of a one-off project, or if, or if you're also drawn to to well, I live with a scientist. Using your approach with other I live with a scientist, and I have to hear every day about <laughs> pi, and about you know how beautiful the gravity is, and blah blah blah. And I've got <laughs> <laughs> Fermi's last theorem. And <laughs> anyway, I what happened was when I first met Paul, what was very attractive was that he was he had all this range of knowledge. Uh, um, that was completely different from mine, and it was stuff that I'd ignored and, and missed out in my sort of much more art-oriented education, and was kind of scared of it because it was, to me, it was sort of secret and very male and, you know, beyond me. And, and so when I met him, he's a great popularizer of science. 
So besides doing uh, crit photography criticism, he's very good at telling lay people how the universe works <laughs> and how beautiful it all is. And you know what I'm saying? So, so, so actually, I thought he was a good person to have in one's life because he could explain sort of everything. You know, like if you needed to know how the television worked, you could ask Paul and he would tell you and in about, you know, a minute and a half before you got bored. But it was good to know that stuff. So, so I decided, because he used to go on and on about how beautiful it all was, um, that, and I didn't know about it and I wanted to, I would, I would re recreate the laws of physics and the principles of mathematics using sort of household objects um, as simply as possible but make them as beautiful as possible and make them kind of dark and mysterious and theatrical, which is how I kind of felt about them, but also understand them in my own way. And, and as I said, like it's gestured towards the fact that he, he th thought of it as beautiful like I thought of, you know, a Rothko was beautiful in a way. Like, does that answer your question? So that was kind of a one-off, one but it was to do with the fact that I was thinking about all that stuff that I hadn't really understood and I'd missed out on and all that stuff. And my association with him, you know, it just sort of all came together and... I guess, I guess underneath the question is the question, are, are, is your plan to do the entire zoological and botanical <laughs> uh, uh, no. repertoire? <laughs> no. Or do, or, do you, or do you see or feel impulses to move towards other subject matter? Or even other stuff. Um, yeah, I, I sort of do whatever comes along that interests me at the time, and it can be different things. It's it's really whatever at the time you know I, I get fascinated with or whatever. But right now, the really the natural world, and that includes the laws of physics, uh, <coughs> is what I make art about. And I joke, I jokingly say to Bill, I don't do any, I don't have people in my pictures. I'm not actually interested in in uh, sociology or or cultural, you know, any documentation of I anything to do with the human race <laughs> doesn't like interest me nearly as much as, as the natural world, as the biological world and the physical world. You know what I mean? I'm much more interested in photographing a nice stone than I am ethnic Chinese. I don't know. <laughs> so when he shows me pictures that have got, you know, Mexican Azteca dancers, I sort of just pass through them and wait, wait for... <laughs> a nice tree picture and say, now that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I do, don't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I think, any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Can you talk just briefly about the materials and the process that take you from the photograph to the art? Well, it's pretty boring, but it's actually very simple. They have black and white photographs that I print, and, and as I said, you know, I'm still totally uh, traditional. I go into a dark room and I print these, so I don't use any digital materials of any kind. These are silver gelatin, in a larger, negative, the whole thing. And then I dry mount them to a piece of mat board. I tone them usually. Martha tones them. I forgot to say that most of what you see here, Martha Smith has fixed, toned, washed the works. So she knows more about it than I do. No. Anyway, so then I colour them. I take them into the studio and I put them on an easel and I start layering paint onto them. And I don't bother with the little tubes of the t tinting stuff. I just get big old tubes of oil paint and start putting it on transparent oil paint on, in many layers. And then I go back with pencil and do pencil. I really use any medium that actually sticks to a photographic surface. And because they come out with new products all the time, artist products, I will buy you know various different crowns and Conte, you, you name it, pastels, or see how they go on photographic material if they stick, you know. So there's not really a, a process I can tell you about. It's pretty much anything that works. Okay, you know? well, I'm going to stop her here because we have a big old batch of books to sell you all. <laughs> um, they are gorgeous, one foot by one foot, and the, the printing is fantastic. Every photograph you see in the show is in this book. They're for sale right over here, and we're going to have Kate back up in front where the name tags were, um, and she'll be signing, and y'all can ask her some more questions at that point. We'll probably move you fairly quickly, though, because some of us have to go home before dawn. Um, but thank you all for coming. Kate, thank you so much. Thank you much. very much. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.